introduce uh, the two uh, panelists for our discussion. Uh, I will give a very short introduction and um, we uh, invited them because they have very uh, interesting and complementary roles. Uh, uh, one is uh, Serena Bonaretti, who is an uh, independent researcher uh, and teacher at Transparent MSK Research. Uh, and uh, she's developing open and reproducible tools for image acquisition, image processing, and biomechanics. So, so she's not directly an uh, academic, but rather a professional working with, uh, uh, with open, uh, uh, open methods. And on the other hand, we have uh, Stephen Scholte, who is a, a philosopher, so studies philosophy, biology, and psychology in Amsterdam, and he's a professor at the University of Amsterdam uh, and the head of the MRI Center of the Behavioral uh, Science Faculty of the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he has worked on research uh, uh, ranging on uh, from uh, fear condition to behavior economics, uh, uh, but he focused on visual perception. Um, maybe the uh, speakers want to say a couple of words about themselves uh, more than this uh, uh, short introduction that they gave. Maybe Serena, uh, are you? Uh, yes, can you hear me? I think yes. so. Yeah, I prepared the, the short presentation as uh, you guys asked. So if you want, I can share that. Um, yes. So I will go for that. All right. Um, sure. Okay. I think it is visible, is it? Yes. All right, great. So thank you very much uh, both for uh, uh, inviting me uh, to this presentation. Thanks uh, to all the organizers also for putting together such an impressive uh, uh, schedule. It's really um, exciting and interesting. Um, as, uh, um, as said, my name is uh, Serena Bonaretti. I'm, I, my background is in biomedical engineering. Uh, I do MSK image analysis. Uh, um, with uh, biomedical with, sorry, with biomechanical applications. Uh, currently, I'm an independent researcher at Transparent MSK Research and an independent teacher at CS Encoding. Here you see the path that uh, brought me to be who and, uh, and what I am today. And uh, down there, you see my uh, the link to my website, esbonaretti.github.io, in case you want to connect with uh, social media, write me, you find the links there. Right now, from a research perspective, I have mainly two aims. The first one is to do open and reproducible research, and the second one is to promote it. Um, usually, I call open and uh, reproducible research just a transparent research to um, go a bit faster. And I would like to share two examples uh, that uh, the way about the way I do it. Uh, the first one is uh, coding, um, and uh, uh, specifically uh, about uh, a bit more than a year ago, I released a package called Pioneer, um, which is uh, uh, about uh, um, that is for um, open and reproducible um, segmentation and analysis of femoral knee cartilage. It is written in Python, and it uses Jupyter Notebooks uh, as a user interface. So each part, pre-processing, segmentation, and analysis, corresponds to one or more Jupyter notebooks uh, that uh, are complete pipelines within themselves. So um, the, from data uh, upload at the very top and potential other users can just change the folder name of uh, uh, their images way down to after uh, the, um, uh, the processing uh, to uh, saving the results and showing the uh, plots and the visualizations. And these notebooks, I'm really fond of them because you can also attach them to papers and uh, share and make everything much more reproducible right away just by using uh, these tools. The second way I uh, do, uh, sorry, uh, the second day I do uh, transparent research is by leading the creation of a community. Uh, we are called uh, the Jupyter Community in MSK Imaging. About uh, two uh, years ago, we got funds from the Jupyter Community itself to create our group. Uh, there was supposed to be a workshop, which of course uh, didn't uh, didn't happen. It, hopefully it's going to happen this coming June. If there is anybody uh, in the uh, group who does MSK Imaging and wants to join, please uh, contact me. We still have some places available. And uh, as you can see here, there are people from all over the world uh, so far. Uh, we are divided in three groups, uh, one more focused uh, on a high resolution CT uh, imaging, one focused on on knee cartilage analysis and one focus on biomechanical applications. 
Um, then how do I promote transparent research? Well, by participating to uh, workshops and conferences like today, I also uh, started uh, two years ago or so a YouTube channel where I occasionally post videos that are really tutorials because what I realized is that people talk and want to do transparent research, but very often they don't know how to practice practically do it. Um, so you can find videos about how to upload notebooks on Binder, how to choose a license for software, how to upload data on Zenodo, how to make a notebook reproducible, how to make code citable, or how to use the Jupyter Python environment. And finally, the second uh, way to promote, or third, uh, to promote transparent research is that I'm currently writing a book uh, which comes from a syllabus that I developed uh, while teaching privately to uh, some students. And uh, um, it is uh, focused on uh, computation, on the development of computational thinking. There are 38 chapters and uh, uh, four, uh, the first four should be out, uh, hopefully, if everything goes fine, this coming Friday. And then every second week, I will upload a new uh, chapter. What is important for me is that uh, this becomes uh, uh, potentially a tool where people who want to code but don't know how to do it or who are transitioning from other programming languages into the Python and Jupyter environment uh, can do this. There are theoretical and computational exercises and mainly I'm creating a community, um, a, a forum uh, part of the website where not only there are uh, the exercises solutions but people can interact and ask each other questions why solutions are like that and so on. So this is uh, uh, the, the summary of what I'm doing so far. I'm very happy to be at this de debate and I'm looking forward to talk uh, more with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, would you like to also say a couple of words about yourself and your work? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'll uh, get the sharing screen on and let's see, is this mm -hmm. us play from start? Uh, yes, does everyone see the screen? Good. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, already a very interesting uh, conference with this session, or at least uh, so far, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, so to start with my, uh, I guess, the sheet. Uh, my name is David Scholt. I'm from the University of Amsterdam. Conflicts of interest. Uh, I am a scientist. Uh, so I want to be cited and I have grants and I need things to get those grants. So that's a big conflict of interest. Uh, I also have uh, started two companies from the university, a startup and a scale-up, and um, happy to have this presentation released under the CCBI license. Okay, so uh, I repeat, Steve Scholte, I got my, well, this is not that interesting. Um, I teach neuroimaging, neuroimaging too. I also teach scientific reasoning and cognitive AI. And I want to go for three recent studies that we published that somehow, let's say, interact with the open science uh, movements. One is, and this was a real, this, it took us eight years to get this paper published and then three different data sets, uh, but we, it, it was recently done. Uh, it, it, it was very difficult to get a paper published showing that the amygdala is not primarily involved in fear acquisition. Very, very difficult. Uh, whilst there's a lot of data showing that the amygdala, whilst being involved in lots of different things, it's just not just primarily a fear attention. Um, so, sorry, I should have started this differently. Uh, so, uh, working on the Imaging Center and in the Department of Psychology, I'm involved in lots of different research and uh, open science, uh, let's say, comes up these days. It's, it's, it's a standard part of our curriculum. Um, and then, so, so another example of where we saw this is an example of a pre-registered study that we just published. And I guess, uh, and, and something that we also recently studied was this big uh, open data set of bigger population studies that we gathered over the years. And I myself, uh, my own lab focuses indeed on computational models of visual perception. That's lots of AI these days. And then trying to see how do, let's say, imaging measures and behavioral measures relate to AI. What's the shared variance? What's the unique variance? What are specific components? Now, as a, um, as a, I, I'm, I'm uh, so, so I, I, that's in somewhat contrast. I'm a very typical scientist at the university. Um, I wanted to add to the discussion so far with, uh, let's say, on uh, reliability, our problems with, let's say, the general alternative hypothesis, hypothesis testing Newman Pearson approach. And what is this problem? That would be because you can multiple comparison correct until you weigh an ounce or even less than that. 
But, uh, oops, that should have gone the opposite. That, uh, this is supposed to represent, let's say, all possible outcomes. Now, if I test an alternative hypothesis, it's a weak hypothesis like, oh, I think there's an effect or I, I want to reject the possibility that there's no effect. You're at best excluding half of the possibilities in the universe. And then uh, Paul Mill already pointed this out in uh, 1967. You need to have very specific hypotheses and or it, it's a central part of uh, the empirical cycle. You need to have specific hypotheses. And if you do not have specific, specific hypotheses, reliability, I mean, it's nice to have high reliability. I would say it's a hygiene factor to have reliability, but without a specific hypothesis, uh, you are not going to buy a lot for it. And so a lack of validity that is good for your specific predictions are often lacking. And I personally think that that has been the biggest source of the replicability crisis. And again, reliability does not help against that. You need to have reliability, but from my perspective, it's a hygiene factor. Of course, you need to share your data. Of course, you need to share your code. Uh, but uh, science needs to be about something, first and foremost. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much. I think these two are really covering the, the two great aspects of reproducible science. So on the one hand, the study design and uh, uh, hypothesis testing, and on the other hand, uh, uh, the availability of, uh, of code and data. Um, I would like to uh, start uh, this, uh, this discussion actually uh, by uh, tying in with uh, uh, publishing, the publishing team uh, and uh, uh, start uh, talking a little bit about uh, the, uh, the questions that were asked. And uh, both questions, there were two questions that were kind of close to each other that uh, as a reader, one person always had problems in accessing data that were stated as available upon request. And on the other hand, uh, uh, um, another person, uh, Sophie Schaumann was asking, uh, uh, isn't it too much for reviewers to also go and review the availability of code and data? And, uh, and shouldn't we have a separate reviewer for that? So who actually checks that uh, the promises that the authors make in the paper are, are fulfilled? Um, maybe uh, we start with the... Uh, scientists part as uh, authors and reviewers uh, uh, what is your experience with uh, with that uh, um, do you ask for that when you review and uh, so to, to let, let me at least respond to that question from a reviewer's perspective often when i review the data uh, if a journal demands that it's going to be open accessible uh, then often it, it then no, the typical response of an author currently would be, it will be accessible when the paper is published. So that makes it impossible to check the quality of what will be published. And that is, uh, that, that's not something, that's not a big thing to push against at the moment. So, so I would say that, that, that it, it, it sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, all, but on the other hand, it does make the life of a reviewer simpler. And then we get to, I, I guess, the more overarching thing, uh, the incentive structure. Already, and it shouldn't be the case, but when I review, I, I am actually very charitable. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, in effect, huh? because, yeah. yeah. We, we are also always assuming that the, the authors are not uh, actively trying to deceive us uh, when, uh, when they are submitting a paper. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I think if the author really wants to deceive us, it's very hard to uh, to find out uh, if it's really the case. Yeah, um, yeah, but again, making data available online on the other hand is also much more uh, so. So the big uh, population thing that we published that took a good PhD student at least four months of additional work, and it was a very capable uh, computer scientist. And uh, so much needs to be checked, so much needs to be validated, and then it's it's. In the incentive structure, and so life for me uh, is easy. I'm a tenured uh, researcher at a big research university, but for a PhD student, he has to think like, where am I going to invest it? Yeah, I mean, uh, shall we check uh, every single paper for reproducibility and should show the reviewers uh, redo the whole analysis every time? Uh, this is a big question. Is it feasible? I, I personally don't think so, but well, uh, what does Serena and the others think? Yeah, this is uh, what I think is that maybe this is one of the future contribution that publishers uh, could uh, provide. 
uh, since uh, there was the debate also before, like uh, where, that, where does the money go? Uh, well, it could go in this, uh, for example, um, so that uh, you know scientists actually take care of analyzing the integrity and the robustness uh, of uh, the thinking of the procedures of the methodologies, etc. But then, uh, from a more practical perspective, which requires time and expertise, a technical time, uh, time and technical expertise to check if the data are uh, available, if the data are uh, homogenized, are organized, the metadata are filled out, etc. If the code uh, is available, if it is robust, um, if, it, if there is a quality uh, behind that code and so on. I think that this is where exactly the publisher could make a huge difference by lifting us up from this burden and uh, taking it out on their shoulders. And then, you know, we would be happy to keep publishing and paying for getting journals reviewed, for example. I don't know. I'm trying to be a bit provocative, maybe, but um, I think this could be a reasonable compromise. Um, and Simon comments, uh, in the case of author reluctance to release code and data until publication, the journal could host the code for the review period or the code and data hosting sites could offer access only by reviewer link until the paper appears. Um, this might cause minor problems with anonymity in case of double blind reviews, but I don't think that they're uh, major. Uh, David, uh, from the publisher slash editor perspective, uh, uh, are, are any of these suggestions feasible? Um, up, up to a point, but, um, you know, like most companies, publishers will do anything for money. Um, and I, I think some of the low level checks that you're talk, talking about, um, can you, does the link work? Can you access the data? That could possibly um, be done um, by the publisher. It may cost a little bit more, but I think it could be something in the scope. As soon as you're starting to ask the publisher to do much more, which requires some high level interaction with the data, um, I think they will blank on you um, because it, it, the, the level of expertise of the people they would have to employ to do that in any meaningful way is, is, is too high. Um, I, I, I think we can't absolve the scientists and the scientific communities from their responsibilities. I think the publishers have to be more um, transparent about what they are doing and to facilitate good practice, but I don't think the publishers, uh, to be fair to them, can become uh, the kind of arbiters of, of, of good practice in, in, in that sense. So I think you need, what, what, I, what I hear and what I think people are missing is, for example, access to, to a good uh, data archiving um, and, and repository facilities at a reasonable price, right? I mean, our, our university has invested an incredible amount in the wake of scandals in the Netherlands for, for data reproduction of, of having a, a repository which actually is funded internally and does allow anonymous reviewer access and a, a, a range of data sharing agreements. And I think that is the responsibility primarily of the universities and the scientific community. But I think in different countries, there are all sorts of impediments to this. And in many ways, it would be much better to have one architecture for these uh, repositories where there's a lot of common ground about what they should be doing. Um, and share these things in, in some way, rather than having continuously different universities and different scientific organizations continuously reinventing the wheel, which is a lot of effort with coding, uh, computer architecture, and legal structures uh, for, for how you set the, these things up. I mean, we've, we've done this, but in, in many ways, we shouldn't have had to have done it as a single university. I see Cassandra nodding. Uh, maybe she wants to add something to this. Uh, yeah, completely agree. Um, so just to sort of reiterate that the, the hard part about the data sharing for us, so we're, we're developing a data sharing platform um, at Wynn at Oxford. And the hard part is not the infrastructure uh, or the, the sort of writing the code to the, the hard part is the legal side. I thought it would be the ethical part, but the ethical, we can just, we can get a handle around the ethical issues, but it's um, for our university, um, they are not used to transferring ownership from 
us to an individual. So when I give you my data to use, I would like to be able to give it to you. The university wants to be able to give it to your institution to become the data controller. So we're having to sort of devise new frameworks. And um, I've been looking at the Donders a lot for this, but also the, um, uh, uh, what's called the CONP in, in Canada. They So they're doing a lot of work with data labs, um, and that it sort of exposes the metadata without exposing the actual data, and that brings lots of benefits there, and it's decentralized um, storage and things. So, yeah, um, completely agree that it, it this is burden is falling to someone to host the sharing of the data and build everything, and no one's quite willing to take it up on a, on a unified way that resolves the problems for all the users and just. Uh, you know, we should be making it simple for people. And at the moment, we're sort of just coming up against barriers. Yes, David? Uh, I'm just wearing my completely different hat as uh, one of the directors of the Donders Institute and someone who was involved heavily in uh, kind of setting up this uh, repository. We're completely willing to share all our expertise and, and, and what we've learned through this. My expertise is actually very negligible, but there are some people in the Donders who've got an enormous amount of uh, practical experience on doing this. And it was our aim in doing it. First of all, we did it for the Donders. We share it with the university. So it's now the university solution. And we're very happy to share with anybody else who wants to look at how, how we, we've set this up. Yeah, I, I think this would be fantastic. And I, uh, there's been a lot of discussion inside the societies uh, I know ESMRMB uh, during the uh, ESMRMB um, annual meeting uh, discussed this, uh, uh, and um, also smaller societies. Uh, there is a real need to share legal practices and uh, ethical practices that uh, so really practical tips on how to achieve this. This is the the greatest uh, the greatest hurdle. Um, going. Uh, um, uh, going a little bit uh, um, back to the uh, to, to the uh, reviewer uh, and and author responsibilities, uh, uh, I thought maybe a win-win situation could be uh, do not put excessive burden on the reviewer practices, but maybe encourage uh, uh, replication and uh, reproducibility studies uh, and uh, help them get published because this is one at the, at the moment, uh, one big hurdle. Um, what, what do you think? Maybe Maria Eugenia, I saw you nodding when I was saying that. <laughs> yes, thanks Francesco. And sorry if you hear baby talking, school is over and the oldest one is back at home. So yes, <clears throat> the point is, it is um, quite hard to ameliorate the, the peer review peer process. It is not perfect, it probably will never be, but um, initiative like, like, your, like what you said before, I think might uh, get some advantages for authors and for reviewers, for example, do not put the, the first question of um, reviewer guidelines is often, uh, is there any novelty in this work? So authors get go searching for some novelty and, and like David said, uh, reinvent the wheel several times just to, uh, just to package something that seems novel. But now the real thing is, can we reproduce what has already been said? We don't have to, to find uh, new, new, new insights. We, we really need to um, corroborate and uh, make what is known or what we think is known and legitimate. We have to get it robust and, and validate it. So yes, uh, special issues on reproducibility or even not special issues, but just uh, types of articles that might be uh, reproducible uh, papers. I think human brain mapping once uh, introduced um, a similar thing, maybe just once. It was more like a special issue, but uh, it should be a thing like negative results. Please publish negative results and tell us that you, you didn't find um, anything on a specific sample even if several other authors uh, found uh, 
something very specific as, as Cassandra showed, uh, harking and the p-hacking. This is how we, we could we could fight these practices. And I'm not saying it's the author's fault because it is really the system that forces you to, to do it, even if you're, you and your reviewers are not uh, evil, let's say. I think Stephen had a direct experience with trying to publish a result that was going against uh, the common. Well, I, so to, to jump into that, I, there are two different factors in there. One thing is, let's say that um, I, I, I don't think people are, let's say, as, as, as open or as honest uh, always as, as, uh, as we implicitly assume here. Uh, but what we did at the big study that we published was not a null zero result study because it's difficult to publish that i think for a good reason because it could be that you have no results because there are no effects or that you have no results because you messed up but what we did and what you can always do with a zero result study so well this gigantic effect is present and this supposed effect is not at all present so it might be there but it's gigantically smaller than that or even better it goes in the opposite direction and so so we didn't publish a null finding we published a very significant finding uh, that the amygdala is a great responder to faces and that there's lots of different categories within that and that something else was much smaller than that and so so you, i i think you can publish zero result finds but you need to validate your experimental line that it did have the quality to that it potentially would have been able to yield those results under those conditions I also don't see why journals would reject that, but uh, so for our thing, our, our, our anti amygdala well, our amygdala paper, there's this entire industry, academic industry of people who cite, review, and uh, cite and review each other for papers and grants and stuff like that. And yeah, if you then say, well, this effect basically is, a, has, is of dubious existence. All of these are somehow maybe purely uh, inclined to, to reject a paper like this. Uh, maybe for open academic reasons, but at least they'll be very inclined to look for problems, much more than for a random thing. And, and I, I think that as so we are acting like this reliability crisis is just a system failure, and that, that there's this chink that needs to be changed and then everything. No, I, I, I think that, that we're underestimating the problem, like I said, of that, uh, that, that data. So not, not all fields of science are suffering from a reliability crisis. There are fields that are suffering less from it and they, these are typically fields with uh more uh with more valid theories um awesome. by Sorry. yeah i deviated there at the end i shouldn't have done <laughs> no, no 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 that's <laughs> that, that's great um we are we don't have too much time but i would uh, still like to go on for a little bit uh, uh also because um seeing a little bit another aspect of the of the situation and th this I, I wanted to ask serena uh serena you're doing a lot of development of uh, open methods that uh, you're developing uh, uh either on your own or commercially and then releasing them in the public i guess uh, these methods sometimes are not uh, uh, are not new as a concept, but this is a, but it's a new implementation that uh, you implement as, as open. What is the uh, reward that you get? So um, can you uh, do you get uh, academic recognition for that, uh, uh, or uh, um, is it possible to publish a new embodiment, an open embodiment of an existing concept, uh, or? Uh, do you need to have specific funding? Do you need uh, private uh, funding for that? Yeah, so um, I start with uh, a lot of things. I start with what I remember. Uh, so the first thing is, uh, um, do you need? Uh, do you get a recognition? Well, uh, the recognition is hopefully that uh, what is done is gonna get useful and it's gonna get used. This is the recognition that uh, one is working uh, that that one is working on. Please go ahead. Oh. Uh, just, um, I, I would like to um, yes. say thank you to David who has to leave, oh, uh, and yeah. uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, and uh, we will we appreciate it your time. Thank you. Well, I, I could I could still take a last question or so, but I'm eating into my next meeting at the moment, which sure. is getting a little embarrassing. No, no, I, I, th so I think I, we are we are going to wrap up. But uh, you're finished you're, with me, okay? Well, well, actually, you, I, I think it's a great uh, it's, it's a great initiative, and and uh, I, I'm really fantastically impressed by the number of people taking part. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, so, uh, on that note, goodbye. Bye. Thank you.
Sorry, Serena. Uh, no, 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 absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That was important. Um, yes, so um, back to uh, code. Uh, for uh, uh, the funding, well, uh, right now there are, they are more and more um, uh, uh, mainly private organizations and mainly, mainly Americans so far uh, who are uh, who are available to fund uh, uh, um, creation of open source software. I'm thinking about uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation or initiative uh, about uh, this loan foundation and so on. So of course, by applying to those grants, um, we aim and hope to collect uh, uh, um, funds to actually do it. Uh, I say we, because of course uh, I am right now currently not in academia, but I never work alone. Of course, uh, I keep working with my academic colleagues because our aim is really to um, put together pipelines that we can all use uh, as a community instead of uh, having all these uh, patches of uh, 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 pipelines, a bit in MATLAB, a bit in Python, a bit in uh, uh, other uh, kind of codes. We really needed to create uh, 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 frameworks that, um, that we can all use and, uh, and work. Um, and then I honestly don't remember what other aspects you were asking me uh, about. I'm really sorry. If you, if you can get uh, academic uh, recognition for your, so is it possible to publish uh, these efforts? Uh... Um, it, it is, it is because uh, let's be honest, uh, one can publish anything. <laughs> we can publish anything anywhere, right? So it always depends where you want to publish. Um, we, we hope to, to get it. Uh, I, I see that, uh, you know, also uh, there is more and more more uh, academic recognition for uh, open source uh, software. Uh, it's, uh, it's a slow process, but it's happening. Um, I can see, like, for example, in other communities, like uh, uh, the computer science community, that uh, uh, people who uh, release or create uh, uh, data sets that are used then for, uh, compa to compare different algorithms on, or other people who create code that is open get more citation, simply because um, the code gets used, the data gets used. So I think that there is a possibility of uh, uh, academic reward. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, when I look, for example, for job applications in academia, so I see that more and more places ask um, if you have uh, open code, if you uh, have created open code and so. So I think that there is a shift. Uh, it is maybe still a little bit slow, uh, but I think that there is. And the fact that uh, meetings like this ones are happening more and more, I think that uh, this is really a movement that from the bottom, right? And so I think that uh, um, uh, institutions, uh, funding agencies, uh, journals are gonna need to adapt. Thank you very much, Trina. You provided the perfect segue to, um, to let everybody know Thank you very much for um, participating. We hate to wrap it up. I think there were so many good conversations going on. Um, but the next opening session is actually goes along with what you were saying. It is about open source and commercial development. So we, we will be hearing from people who have experience in um, open source development, sustainability, how they got funding, um, including a talk from Travis Oliphant, who is um, will be bringing in a talk about making a software free um, and then driving commercial success from it too. So I hope that there's um, some opportunities um, to exactly go off what you were just um, talking about. <laughs>